Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm an engineer on Firebase, and I focus on building tools that help developers build secure applications that protect end users' privacy. If you haven't used Firebase before, we're a back-end as a service platform. The products that we're best known for and the products that I work with most closely are the primary building blocks for creating applications. The real-time database is a NoSQL database that eliminates the need for pulling by pushing updates to the clients. Firestore is a database of collections and documents. It's also real-time and it's built to scale up with you. Firebase Storage hosts your images and files just like you'd expect. Firebase Authentication handles user management. And Firebase Hosting hosts flat web pages. It can be combined with the other products to become a full-fledged web app. And Firebase Functions is bits of compute, the glue that connects Firebase products together. Looking at all of these products, they may seem not that special. After all, all cloud providers offer databases. Firebase is differentiated by the developer experience, by our SDKs and our tooling. We track developer satisfaction scores the way that most companies track their net promoter scores but I don't want to say that we have it all figured out. It's a constant trade-off. This talk is a story of what we've experimented with, where we stumbled and had to learn, and what we want to do more of. When Firebase was starting out, one primary goal was that anyone could get a new app up and running in about five minutes. This was a huge factor in Firebase becoming popular with app developers, especially mobile developers. And I understand the importance of having a great first impression. I remember the first time I ran git push Heroku main, and a minute later, my Rails app was live on the internet. It blew my mind that it was that easy. Firebase wanted to do that for a different developer. The first five minutes should feel like things just work. We did this mostly by being opinionated. Instead of getting all the dials and knobs that you would get with a cloud provider, Firebase gives you reasonable defaults where the cloud developer says, I need this size database instance that is located here and it should replicate like this, the Firebase developer says, I need a database. I should point out here that after Firebase was acquired by Google, Firebase products were rewritten to work with Google backends. Today, for most Firebase products, you can use Firebase or an equivalent Google Cloud product. People choose to use Firebase because they would rather focus on building their app. I want to start with a story of how this emphasis on the first impression caused some debt that we had to work out of. And I should say at the start, this is not what we do anymore. First, if you were setting up a new traditional database, you would need to configure the database and the server. That ends up being a few hours of pasting environment variables and writing YAML. But in the end, you have a server that acts as a natural place to restrict access. Only the server can talk to the storage layer. Firebase went a different direction. Clients connect directly to the back end. And the only way that that is OK is that there's a security configuration file called security rules. It enforces limits on who is allowed to access any specific part of the database. Here's what Firestore security rules look like. Say I have an e-commerce app. I can write a rule that says users can only read from or write to their own cart, but users can't see or modify other people's carts. This decision was choosing a side in a trade-off. We've made it fast to try something out and get something working, but before developers ship their app and start saving real user data, they'll need to go back and configure permissions in this separate file. When I joined Firebase, they said to me, we think we have lots of insecure projects. We're not really sure how many. It's your job to reduce that number, whatever it is. Good luck. Oh boy. So I started looking into it, figuring out how Firebase backends were becoming insecure, what was happening there, and why was it happening? In order to make sure that people's first moment with the product was not a permission denied error, the first product that we had, the real-time database, had default security rules that allowed any user who was signed in to do anything. We told developers that they needed to go back and update their security rules before they became a production app, 
but lots of them ignored us, so we learned from that. When we launched Firestore, we knew that we wanted to try something else. When someone added Firestore to their project, they had to choose if they wanted their security rules to start in test mode, where access was open, or locked mode, where access was locked down. This may seem like a trivial change, because they could still choose to start with wide open security rules. But this was an improvement for a couple of reasons. It was only a moment of friction in creating your project, just one dialog box that you had to click through. And there's not a right or wrong answer here. Either way, you still need to tailor these security rules to your application. But it's a reminder at the very beginning that you need to come back to this. When I was early in my career, I thought that all friction was bad. The goal of building great products was to remove friction. After working in the authentication and security space for years, I know that friction is a tool to make developers pause and think about something. This tiny bit of friction didn't solve everything, of course. People still were able to ship insecure apps, and they did, but far fewer of them did. Still, we need to keep iterating. Our next attempt at reducing insecure projects was to change the default rules. The new defaults let all requests through for a month. After a month, if they still hadn't updated the rules, they'd start getting emails from us. And they'd start getting permission denied errors in their app. Some percentage of these developers would just update this hard-coded timestamp to be further in the future. And in that case, we sent them even more annoying emails. But most developers would stop and actually write configurations here. This is a deferred friction point. It keeps the immediate flow of creating an app smooth, but after you've had time to build your app, we put up a wall that developers have to respond to. Eventually, with new defaults, with annoying emails, we were able to reduce the number of insecure projects. I still think we have more iterating to do, though. If you are writing your security rules at the same time that you're building your application, your security rules act like a schema. You end up creating a cleaner database if you're thinking about the access patterns from the start. And it's less painful than if you try to bolt security onto an already written app. So hopefully we can tighten up this timeline, give them a few days to try things out and experiment with data structures, and then they need to start thinking about security. This space is really full of trade-offs. By optimizing for the initial developer experience, we limited what we could do for the developers who were building on Firebase day in and day out. Those were our power users. And I know this happens at other places too. At a previous company I worked, for the longest time, we couldn't add some features that would have helped newcomers feel more welcome. We worried that it would slow down our power users. Eventually that shifted. That was when we decided that we needed more customers. Luckily, we had a group of power users inside of Firebase who could make the changes that they needed. While most people have a few Firebase projects, the developer relations engineers each have a few hundred. We make tons of apps and we fill all the pain points. The DevRel engineers started musing to themselves, what would it be like if there was a version of Firebase running on my local machine? That could cut the iteration time maybe drastically. Imagine if I'm working on a cloud function. Instead of having to deploy it to Firebase, which takes a few minutes, and then I make a few changes and I deploy it again, what if I could test it as quickly as just refreshing a browser? If I could try 10 things in a minute, I'm going to do better work than if I can just try one. What if that local version of Firebase would have hot reloading and pick up changes from this app source code without needing to refresh or restart? That could bring the iteration time even more. It would have to be as close as possible to production though. If something works on my machine, but breaks when it's deployed, we're not helping anybody. So it should probably pull in binary straight from production code when it can, and where that doesn't work, we could re-implement the APIs. What if it had a clean, simple interface? You wouldn't need to start a local version of each Firebase product that you would want to use or pass in a lot of environment variables. You shouldn't even need to tell it what products you're using. It should be able to look and see. Actually, there was an existing emulator that Google Cloud made for functions, but it only ran one function. If you needed to test more than one function, then you need to start that functions emulator several times. 
this emulator that we would build, this would be different. There could be one command that would start everything you need. What if it had self-healing errors? If something goes wrong, give me a link to what I need to enable or tell me how to fix it. Like if it doesn't see any JavaScript files, but it does see some TypeScript files, instead of telling me file not found, what if you told me, did you forget to compile? Because yes, I did. And this is what became the Firebase Emulator Suite, a place where instead of optimizing for the first five minutes, we could optimize for the day in and day out routine of development. A few unexpected things started to happen once the emulator, emulators got off the ground and started to gain adoption. Every quarter, Firebase had goals of, about how much we should try to grow the number of Firebase projects. It was always some large multiple. And frankly, not having emulators to artificially inflate the numbers towards those goals caught us by surprise. How many Firebase products, projects does it take to build an app? N plus one, where N is the number of development and test environments that you need, plus your one production instance. Requiring developers to set up extra projects for the development and test environments was great for helping us meet our goal numbers, but it also made the numbers less meaningful. Now that each new product is one app, our goal numbers are a better reflection of reality. We've also started to build things into the emulator that will never make it to production. My favorite example is functionality to test and debug your security rules. We know that writing security rules is the kind of thing that scares some people. If you make a mistake, you could accidentally break your application by cutting off access that it needs to operate, or even worse, make public data sorry, make personal data public to the entire world. And if the only place you have to test those changes is in production, that's really scary. But the emulator should give you all the tools that you need to be confident that you're doing the right thing. For example, we've created a testing library that you can use with the emulator for unit testing your security rules. These kinds of tests are quick to write. You stub out the user with the attributes that you want to test and assert if the user should be denied or permitted when they make a specific request. I love these tests. It brings developing your security rules up to the standards of the rest of your development and you get all the confidence that you're used to with automated test. You can add it to CI and now you know that someone won't accidentally dismantle the logic that you've written. We've also added methods for debugging security rules that only work in the emulators. For instance, comparing time is always a little bit tricky. Here I have a rule that says a comment can be edited for an hour after it was written. I can add a debug statement to any expression in my rules and the emulator will log that to standard out, just to let me double check my logic. This may seem like a feature that should also go into production. Honestly, it won't. Rules are code that was written by a user and that we're evaling in a time critical path when a request comes into Firebase. So we constrain what can happen in rules. We want to make sure that we can always evaluate this quickly. We're super strict about latency in rules, so we don't want to add any extra IO. But that doesn't apply to the local emulator. So going forward, we're going to make the emulator the best place to debug, test, and develop. To wrap up, We've learned a lot of things from trying to cater to the first five minute experience in Firebase. We've discovered that we weren't leaving our developers in a great place, and we were giving them a dopamine hit rather than setting them up for success. Now with the emulator suite, we're trying to find a balance. The emulator started as a place for our power users. The irony is that as we continue to build out the emulators, it's now becoming many newcomers first moment with Firebase with a different focus. Instead of emphasizing, look, your app is live, the emulators emphasize learning to debug and test before anything goes live. Both aim to keep your developers moving fast, but where production dazzles, the emulators want to help you develop. So thanks for having me, and I want to take a moment to applaud everyone who's contributed to the Firebase emulators. You're the best.